Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Brian Stone. I want to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar. Um, We're so fortunate today to, to have um, our partners at Youth Represent um, be sharing with us uh, some, some general information about criminal history checks and how um, they can become a huge deterrent to people getting jobs. Um, Eric Eingold um, works at Youth Represent in New York City, and he has graciously volunteered his time um, today to um, provide us with this information. Um, I also wanted to make sure I noted for everybody that this webinar is being recorded and we'll be sharing this webinar widely. Um, so please feel free to pass it along to any of your colleagues who weren't able to attend in person today. Um, and we'll also be sharing these uh, PowerPoint presentation slides um, so that you can have access to them. Um, as far as logistics for today's presentation go, Eric will be presenting for about 30 minutes. Um, and then after that time, we're going to open it up for questions at the end. So I will um, unmute all lines at that time, and you can feel free to ask your questions directly to Eric. Um, but also feel free to use the chat feature. Um, if you're online using the web browser, you can use the chat feature to type in your questions. Um, and, and we'll make sure we read them off and get answers to your questions that way. Um, so without further ado, I am going to turn things over to Eric Eingold. Eric, thanks so much for being here. Perfect. Great. My name is Eric. Uh, I'm a lawyer at Youth Represent. We, Youth Represent is um, a holistic legal services nonprofit uh, based in New York, uh, focused on areas relating to uh, reentry, uh, so criminal justice work, all the collateral consequences of what comes after a person's been arrested. Um, we serve um, over 1,000 1,200 young people a year across all five boroughs of New York City in areas relating to criminal court, um, uh, uh, what we'll talk about today, criminal records, uh, employment discrimination on the basis of a criminal record, issues that our participants or that our clients have relating to housing. Uh, we represent um, in family court, uh, primarily helping young fathers of color and also, of course, young mothers uh, in custody, visitation, and child su um, support proceedings. Um, so we, uh, cr uh, we practice, um, as I said, um, through the five boroughs of New York. And um, just the way we work is we partner with a lot of community-based organizations and court-mandated programming. Uh, who are uh, uh, who are working with young people who have been arrested and are going through an alternative to incarceration or an alternative to juvenile detention program, and we'll meet and we'll be their lawyer from kind of start to finish, so working with them on any issues we practice in and also sticking with them for the long haul. So if a client of ours um, reaches out a few years later with um, with a case they need help on, we can work on that stuff. Um, so we're going to talk about criminal record stuff today. Um, what a criminal record is and uh, how it impacts a person's uh, employment, uh, how, how it can um, be a barrier to an, a person finding employment. Um, I'll also be starting uh, as an Equal Justice Works Fellow next month in September, focusing on uh, implementing um, New York City's Fair Chance Act, which we'll talk about towards the end of the session, but really focusing on using New York State, New York City's uh, protections for people with criminal records um, as they look for work in the job market. Um, so, uh, so let's talk about what a criminal record is and what it includes. Um, so a criminal record, um, or a rap sheet as like it's commonly called, uh, the, the RAP and RAP sheet actually stands for something. Um, it is the, the record of a person's arrests and prosecutions. Um, but uh, when people hear or talk about criminal records, it's rare that they're really talking about what the RAP sheet is. Um, uh, typically, what a, when businesses um, do a criminal record check, uh, they're getting a publicly available record of a person's contact with law enforcement agencies. And just to... Um, to say that because so many arrests and convictions happen at the state level, um, it can be really difficult for a person who uh, has been arrested in different states to um, get a sense of what shows up on their criminal background. This is a big deal for us in New York because a lot of our clients have also um, had contact in uh, New Jersey or Connecticut, so helping a young person um, for our clients, right, 24 and under, figure out what shows up when they're applying for a job can be really difficult. So I just 
think that's an important tension to have uh, or note to have in mind when talking about this stuff. Um, of course, a criminal record can be confusing for people who are older than 24 uh, because of the, um, it requires a person to have a pretty um, in-depth awareness of the criminal justice system and how cases work. So a criminal record can refer to uh, any arrests or convictions, dispositions, so how a case ends. Uh, if a person has any open warrants for if they missed a court date, that'll show up on a background check. Um, Dismissals and not guilty verdicts might show up depending on who's doing the search and what it's for, and parole violations might show up as well. Um, cases that are sealed or expunged should not show up, but um, as we'll talk about, uh, errors are really pervasive um, uh, through in, in this field, and we do a lot of work at Youth Represent correcting errors. Um, and just, uh, yes, yeah, so we'll go to the next slide. Perfect. So, um, so I'll kind of walk through how a criminal record gets to um, the person who is, uh, I, I guess, uh, wh how it goes from arrest to how it appears. So that's, I think, uh, helpful to walk through that now. So um, if I get arrested, and the, the way it works in New York um, is that a person gets arrested uh, they'll be taken to a police precinct, and the police precinct will take a copy of a person's fingerprints and then send them up to the New York State uh, like Depository of Criminal Record Stuff. Um, it's called the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services, uh, DCJS. DCJS will put uh, that person's arrest history into a rap sheet, or if it's the person's first ever arrest, they will then create a rap sheet for the person. Uh, and from that point on, that's when the person's criminal record appears. Um, the rap sheet will be updated by court personnel over the course of the case. Um, and so there's a lot of human uh, interaction with that. And then depending on your state's laws, the way that the case ends uh, will determine whether or not it shows up on a criminal record search. So in New York, state law requires that a person who is uh, brought into court and whose case does not end in a criminal conviction to not show up on a criminal background check. But uh, errors are really common. So um, why do errors occur? Uh, it, because of human interaction in the court system. So um, court clerks have to enter in information into a computer. In New York, it looks like really early version of, um, I don't know if anybody remembers DOS. I remember like my using my grandfather's computer when I was like, like eight years old, um, playing early like computer games. Um, so the, our court technology is really old and really stretched. Um, so a court clerk has to enter information. That information has to get sent to the state record depository. Um, and so if a clerk mis-enters something or if a clerk is overworked or maybe didn't get enough sleep n the night before, the clerk might just miss putting something into the system. Uh, and that information will never be updated um, for the central repositories that are used by police prosecutors in the courts. States, because, again, because so many of our arrests and convictions happen at the state level, states uh, will update, when, when states update their database, they're supposed to send it to the FBI database. But if we're talking about errors and how errors happen in New York, imagine that at a magnitude of 50, um, and, and you can imagine how many errors are in the FBI database. So, um, and, and that's a main, FBI database is a main point for, for uh, people's criminal records to be distributed to a whole host of people who are searching for them that we'll talk about later on in the presentation. So, uh, so employers, when they get a criminal record check, they're getting it, um, they will contact a background check company who in the law is called a credit reporting agency. Uh, and that credit reporting agency will um, will buy will, will do a criminal record search uh, from a state database, and they can buy records that have mistakes and outdated information. So our office, we're working. Um, we have two federal class actions that, that we filed over the last few months uh, against Madison Square Garden and um, the Barclays Center, um, at another basketball stadium in Brooklyn. Um, because we had clients who uh, had cases misreported on their background checks, um, cases that um, 
that uh, showed up with, uh, with misinformation. So the type of errors that we see the most often are arrests that are reported that don't have a final disposition. The disposition is how the case ended. So if you get arrested and you get charged with a crime and your case ends without being found guilty, in New York State, your case should get dismissed and sealed. Um, that's a common error that it, that it doesn't, that the uh, criminal record doesn't reflect the dismissal. Um, sometimes police, when they're taking a person's finger, fingerprints, will take them twice. And so now there's um, the, the, the state uh, de, uh, depository of criminal records now has two cycles that they're working with, but only one is going through the system. So um, th something as simple as a, a mistake at a police precinct can be something that plagues a person for years. Um, if you have a, a bench warrant because you didn't go to court, but you then go to court to clear the warrant and the clerk doesn't put that in, that can be that that case will then show, st still show up as open. Um, and that's another case that, that should have been sealed, but still appears. And again, this is, um, Brian mentioned uh, earlier, this stuff is really confusing and, and we'll take questions at the end. So I um, also want to say this field is really nebulous and really confusing. So um, yeah, if you have questions, that's, that's yeah, I, I, we'll talk about that as we get to it. Um, so uh, errors matter, right? Because all of this stuff on criminal records matters. Um, I, I, it's between 75% and 80% of employers in the country uh, will do a criminal record check before hiring somebody. Um, so that, so um, you know, having an error on your background check that that shows a case as open that should not be open can be a really big deal. Also, if you've been charged with a felony, but your case ends in a misdemeanor, the case should only show up as the misdemeanor in New York. But if you have an error that keeps the case open, your employer will see the felony charge, and that looks scarier to, to businesses. Landlords do criminal record checks. Universities require people to disclose what's on their criminal record, and public housing authorities also. So in New York, if you have an open case, uh, the New York City Public Housing Authority, NYCHA, um, can move to evict you. Um, and so, you know, people will, um, yeah, will be plagued by these errors and also, you know, what's on the record check in New York, we have really bad ceiling laws that, um, uh, keeps a person's conviction, even for low level misdemeanors open for life. So, um, you know, we have clients who, um, yeah, who, who, who have a whole bunch of stuff on their, um, criminal records show up and, and it, it can be really minor stuff. Also, this stuff is really confusing because if, if you, are a young person and you're arrested and you're brought into court, uh, or, or again, an old person, an older person that doesn't have a legal expertise, um, folks that uh, apply for jobs in jurisdictions that don't ban the practice of, um, that, that allow businesses to ask about criminal conviction on a background check, if a person doesn't um, answer, doesn't disclose all of their convictions, a business can fire them or can decide not to hire them uh, on the basis of the failure to disclose. So um, though we do a lot of work just helping people get copies of their uh, background check and preparing them to talk about it, uh, talk about their convictions when they're applying for work to help them figure out what shows up as, a, as an open case on a background check and what doesn't. Cool. Okay, so um, criminal records and employment. Um, uh, so that... The, the way that this works, uh, I went over it earlier, but it's, we can review it again. It's pretty important that, like how the, the different systems that um, go into uh, what's reported. So, um, so how employers access a person's criminal record. So let's say like Eric Eingold, Inc. Uh, I'm a business and um, I have a practice of, which is legal, of doing criminal background checks before hiring somebody. I will hire a background check company um, to, uh, to do, uh, I'll pay like a hundred bucks and I'll say, hey, uh, I'm going to hire um, you know, uh, Brian Stone. I'm thinking about hiring Brian Stone. Brian has signed a disclosure form that allows me to um, get a copy of his background check. Uh, and then uh, I'll contact the, the consumer reporting agency and I'll say, hey, I'm a business in New York, so I'll pay for you to do a background check of uh, Brian's New York record and maybe his New Jersey record and maybe his Connecticut record. Or I will also have the option of hiring the consumer reporting agency to check um, the person I'm going to hire their record all across the country. Or I can do even more targeted searches like seeing if a person is on in any sex offender registries. 
Um, so the consumer reporting agency will um, either um, have one already on the person in their internal database uh, if that if the person has applied for a job at another employer and the employer asked, or all of these consumer reporting agencies will also, before they go pull the records from the state databases themselves, will see if any of the other credit reporting agencies have Brian's record on file. Uh, and if they do, they'll just pay you know, some sort of premium to get it from the other company. So they'll get that. They will um, put it into some sort of document and then send it to the employer. And the employer will see the finished product, which shows how many convictions a person has if a person has none, it'll show up as none. If a person has, you know, one, it'll show an arrest date, a conviction date, um, if the person did any time, and uh, what the offense was. Um, so the way these work, the, the like what the how the the information that goes on a criminal record um, is uh, kind of think of it as as kind of like a. Um, uh, like interwoven systems, and uh, and it's a, a tre it's a tremendous industry. So again, so we'll just walk. Um, so here's it all. Uh, the, what I was just talking about provided again. So um, these companies, Experian is a really big one, and Sterling Background Check is one that we see a lot. Um, we'll check. Uh, we'll do a name data uh, data birth search into um, the state database, uh, and they have to get authorization first. So this thing, uh, DCJS to the right of that. That's our New York State uh, Central Repository for Criminal History. Uh, I included New York State stuff um, knowing that not everybody listening to this is in New York, but I, I think that most states follow this system. Um, so DC, DCJS uh, is um, kind of like a higher uh, level of security or confidentiality um, that a, a search a person can do. Um, they they will only do background checks on people using fingerprints, um, and in our state law in New York, that's a restricted um, universe of folks. So um, only uh, a small number of businesses are allowed to use a person's fingerprints to do a background check, and that tends to be for people who are looking for work in businesses where they're or in industries where they're working with vulnerable communities. So like in schools or working with the elderly or in hospitals um, or as a security guard, things like that. Um, so very few agencies have access to that. This Office of Court Administration Criminal History Record Search, I think other states have similar things. Um, that's where the credit reporting agencies will go to the state to get a person's background check in New York using the name and date of birth search. So it costs, that I think costs between 80 and $65 for the credit reporting agency to do. Uh, the credit reporting agencies will do that. They'll go to the state depository rather than going to, you know, um, uh, New York County Criminal Court and Brooklyn Criminal Court and things like that. Um, and then um, this FBI database, uh, a lot of governmental agencies um, will have access to it and uh, um, some employers will. But again, that database require is, is, is what it gets from the states. And the state databases are full of errors. So... Um, this is also a, a point where uh, a mistake that's made early on in a person's time in the criminal court system can come back to, to play them on a rap sheet. So, um, so let's say I, um, so let's say uh, you know I get Brian's rap sheet back. I see that Brian has a, a conviction that um, that gives me second thoughts about hiring him. Um, and so I say, Brian, you know, we think you're really great, but we're going to pass on hiring you because of you know, X, Y, Z conviction. Um, um, that that's a really common thing that we see for our uh, clients, people who have uh, criminal records who are kept out of the workforce because of their experience in um, the criminal court system. Right? This um, is a a, a real. Um, uh, I mean. I, a lot of the a lot of the way that um, the credit reporting industry is done um, is really reflective of the broader inequities that happen in communities that are over policed and already marginalized. Um, and knowing what we know about the ways in which Black and Brown communities um, are put into the criminal justice system at rates that are disproportionate to 
crime that's committed in those, committed in, in those communities, uh, and also the way that a person's involvement in the criminal justice system hangs around with them long after they've served any sort of sentence. Uh, employment discrimination is one of the ways that has the, um, one of those uh, most severe collateral consequences that a person has. Um, a person can be denied a job or a license from state agencies, um, yeah, and of course has that disparate impact on communities of color. So we'll talk about different protections that people have when applying for work, just to issue spot for you all. So um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, passed in 1964, prohibits employers from discriminating against employees on the basis of sex, race, color, national origin, and religion. 1964, of course, before our uh, mass incarceration crisis, uh, but in 2012, uh, the EEOC issued an enforcement guidance uh, on the consideration of arrests and conviction records and employment discriminations to address discriminatory practices that preclude individuals with criminal records from employment opportunities and issued um, uh, requirements that, set, that um, require businesses to not have any automatic bar, um, and we're on the next slide now where these factors are, um, to not have any automatic bar against people with an arrest or criminal record. So I can't, as a business, um, have a policy, uh, let's say like I'm a bank, I can't have a policy that says nobody that has ever been convicted of a robbery can work here, period. Um, if I want to, um, uh, if I, I, as a business, see that a person has uh, a conviction that, that gives me second thoughts about hiring them, uh, th I have to do some work to show that uh, that I considered, uh, that I did some sort of individualized determination on the person's conviction. And uh, the EEOC guidelines, which operate uh, as a baseline, right, because states and cities can have more robust enforcement protections, um, the EEOC requires employers to consider the nature and the gravity of the offense, the time that's passed since the conviction or the person's completion of a sentence, and the nature of a job that is being sought. So. Let's say, like, um, um, I, I am, uh, you know, uh, a bank again, and I, and I see that a person is applying for a job as a bank teller, and um, 20 years ago, they had a, tr a, a very low-level trespass convic conviction, um, uh, and I'm not going to hire the person. That person seemed, seemingly would have a pretty good... Uh, would have a pretty good basis to go to the EEOC and allege that they've been a, um, a victim of a violation under Title VII. We're seeing more of these coming through um, and were before the uh, change in administration, but the, um, that the, um, a person can file something with the EEOC. It's a, it's a pretty tight statute of limitations. It can be either 180 or 300 days to file something depending on um, what else the person is doing uh, over the um, and what their uh, local law allows for, um, but uh, filing a complaint to the EEOC is a, um, uh, allows um, yeah it can, can be a good uh, a helpful way for a person to, um, to to prosecute a case of employment discrimination. Um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act is the law that regulates um, background check companies uh, and what they do. So this law was written in, I believe, the 70s, uh, again, before the explosion of the background check company. So um, the law itself is uh, not really designed for, um, for uh, criminal background checks, but uh, over the course of years, background check uh, companies have been regulated under the Act. Uh, FICRA, as it's called, is notoriously confusing. I once had to do a 20-page memo on FICRA that was um, exhausting. Um, but um, uh, it, it, it has really good requirements that are designed to um, ensure that a person whose job offer is being rescinded on the basis of uh, what shows up on a background check has some information of what was disclosed. Uh, that the person has to give a written authorization to the background check company to check their record, um, and if the business if uh, business is going to take an adverse action on the basis of a criminal record, um, the person has to be notified of it in order so that they can uh, alert the business to an error, 
uh, on the background check, and the person also has to be given a summary of their rights. So just to this um, top section 602, um, it also requires consumer reporting agencies to have reasonable, reasonable procedures uh, in a manner that's fair and equitable to the consumer. The consumer is the person who's ba who is being the subject of a background check. Um, with regard to confidentiality, accuracy, relevancy, and the proper use of information in accordance with the requirements of their title. That reasonable, reasonable procedures language does not mean that any time a credit reporting agency uh, has an error on my background check that I have an automatic federal lawsuit. Um, it, plaintiffs will also have to show that the business failed to have reasonable procedures in that the credit reporting agency failed to have reasonable procedures in place to correct a person's um, background check. Also, just to flag, the Supreme Court last uh, term issued a decision in a case called Spokio versus Robbins that um, had a uh, m makes it harder for class action FICRA cases to be brought um, against consumer reporting agencies. So, this is an area of the law that is um, really interesting and, and really. Um, moving um, because of that case. So plaintiffs are having to show a higher level of injury to satisfy Article Three standing to um, go after uh, credit reporting agencies who are misreporting information. Cool. Um, and so the last two slides are um, uh, relevant mainly to our work in New York, but um, the law across the country is changing on this stuff, so um, I thought it'd be relevant to discuss. In New York, um, in New York City, uh, the City Council in 2015 passed something called the Fair Chance Act, uh, which is um, a ban the box law. Um, ban the box laws are happening, uh, are being passed in cities and states around the country. Um, the ban the box, the box it refers to is that question that that used to appear on background check or on uh, job applications that would ask people uh, if they've ever been convicted of a crime or if they'd be willing to submit to a criminal background check um, before even meeting the business, right? Because what would happen would be a person would check the box, yes, I've been convicted of a crime, here's what it was, it was a, you know, a felony from 2001, I made a mistake, and um, businesses would just kind of take their application, set it aside, and not... Uh, get back to applicants, right? Um, so the law in New York uh, makes it illegal, in New York City, makes it illegal for employers to ask about a person's conviction history uh, or even to allude to um, a requirement of a background check before making a conditional job offer. Um, the conditional job offer, the, job, the condition on the job offer is the background check. So it has to be the last thing that the employer asks in the hiring process. Um, so if the uh, so let's say you go um, you go to an interview you nail it the business then says you know Eric we think you did really great you're really smart you're really funny uh, we want to hire you there's just one thing we need to know and it's at that point when they can ask about a criminal conviction history if I have a conviction and I disclose it then uh, and the employer wants to revoke the job offer the employer has to leave the job open for three days. Um, those three days have, uh, are designed to allow me to have a more in-depth discussion about the circumstances of the conviction, evidence of rehabilitation. Uh, I'm, uh, the business has to give the person a copy of their background check and then um, a copy of the rights under Article 23A, which we'll talk about in the next slide, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And so the next slide here is um, uh, Article 23A of the New York State Correction Law. I'm not sure how broadly applicable this is across the country, um, but in um, but I imagine that uh, New York isn't the only state that has a protection like this. So under Article 23A, it makes it illegal for businesses in New York um, to discriminate against somebody on the basis of a criminal record unless the business can show a close connection between the job duties and a person's conviction. So um, if I have a drug... Um, a drug conviction, it's going to be hard for me to work in a pharmacy, for example. Uh, so that's one basis to deny a job. And the other is if a person poses an unreasonable risk to people or property. Um, so, uh, you know, violent offenses can be an issue. But even if the uh, employer wants to deny a job on that conviction, it has to do an individualized analysis using um, eight or nine factors 
and it has to the employer has to consider how much time has lapsed since the offense, how old I was at the time of the offense, um, how long I was incarcerated for, if I have any evidence of rehabilitation or good conduct, um, severity, all that kind of stuff, uh, and um, and that interacts with the Fair Chance Act because if you're in New York City where the Fair Chance Act applies, the business has to actually share their analysis with you. Um, so that you can see that they've actually done one. And this gets rid of a problem that was really pervasive in the city where employers would just come up with excuses after the fact and do a very perfunctory analysis because they weren't required to show their work. And the Fair Chance Act is a way to kind of box employers in to force them to comply with the law. Cool. So that was what I um, prepared. I, I would just say that this area, the criminal record stuff, is one that is uh, incredibly confusing, but also incredibly uh, interesting. Um, and um, yeah, I've worked at UFR Present for, I interned here my last year of law school, uh, and then I um, have been here uh, since I graduated from Brooklyn Law in 2015. And after that amount of time, I only feel like now I'm in a place where I can present on it just because this stuff is so, um, yeah, it is so hard to, to wrap one's head around. But I'd love to hear if folks have questions. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. That was really, really informative. Um, good background information and just sharing with us why um, why this all matters, um, especially for people who, who don't understand the legal system. So thank you for sharing this today. I, I have unmuted all the lines. Um, so if you're on a phone, please feel free to just uh, share any questions you have, and then for those who are only on computers, um, there is that, that ability to type in your questions um, to the chat box. Um, so I'm going to um, give you all about a, a minute here to type in any questions, or, and also feel free to ask anything that, that you want to know more about from Eric. And also thank you, Eric, for providing your uh, contact information on this slide. So if you yeah, want to absolutely. And, out. Yeah, and folks should feel definitely free to reach out. My my email's not there, um, but if folks have questions or want to learn more about our organization, um, yeah, but Brian, I would uh, yeah, in, in, encourage folks, I guess, to contact you and get it from me there. Absolutely, yeah. That's, we're more than happy to do that. So. Great. Uh, let's leave everything open for a minute here. Eric, while we're waiting for questions, I just wanted to um, ask if you could talk a little bit about your upcoming Eagle Justice Works Fellowship, and, and will you be continuing on in this same type of work uh, at, at Youth Represent during your fellowship? Yep, so the fellowship focuses on implementation of the Fair Chance Act. Um, so it's only been on the books in New York for um, under two years, so um, 22 months. Um, so. Uh, I'll be working uh, full-time on, on those cases, um, looking first at the, um, the ways in, in the, the success or the, the ways in which the act has been implemented, uh, and if there's been success, successful litigation, studying the litigation strategies of it, uh, also seeing the degree to which businesses are aware of their heightened requirements, and then um, working with young people who have criminal records who are going to be given an opportunity to, uh, who are going to make it further in the hiring process than they ever have before, because they won't have been weeded out at that point. And then they'll have to talk about their convictions with employers. So also doing some uh, coaching with people with uh, criminal convictions to uh, help them, help them give them a sense of uh, how to talk about them um, at an interview uh, in a way that um, <laughs> it won't, in a way that will, uh, hopefully allow them to have that um, be a powerful experience and not just a, I made a mistake when I was younger kind of thing, but um, in a point, in a way that they can actually form a, um, a sense of um, I don't know, a, a handling the trauma that comes with being a young person who's put through the criminal court system. Great. It sounds like it was going to be a, a very challenging, but I think um, necessary project. Yeah, I'm really excited for it and really grateful for the opportunity. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll be excited to, to hear more about it. Um, so here's a, here's a question that was just sent in. Um, is what were the political battles like for passage of the act um, in New York? And then kind of the secondary part is who were the champions and who were the groups opposed to passage of that act? Cool. Uh, great question. So the, um, so interesting uh, history of the Ban the Box movement. Um, so the, the people that came up with the um, this idea that you should make it illegal for employers to be able to ask the question um, have historically been groups of incarcerated persons, incarcerated people who, uh, formerly incarcerated people, um, who think about this stuff and work on this stuff and do kind of grassroots organizing following their time um, while they were incarcerated. Uh, so in the city, we have uh, um, a host uh, in New York. There, there's a number of really cool grassroots racial justice, lead, racial justice focused organizations um, who had been pushing this for years. So in New York, groups like um, Communities United for Police Reform that were also involved in the big stop and frisk lawsuit um, from, I think, 2013 or 14, um, and other organizations um, focused on racial justice and reentry. So really affected people uh, were the folks who were pushing on this stuff the hardest. Um, and then on the other side, you had, you know, chambers of commerce uh, and management sided lobbyists and firms um, who um, who tended to say, hey, this is, you know, government um, uh, getting too involved in our decision making. We as businesses need to be able to know who we're hiring so that we're not liable for any uh, any um, negligence claims uh, that can come. Just an interesting point on that, the, um, the rate at which people who, um, the re recidivism rate for people who have jobs is significantly, significantly lower than, than people who, um, who've been incarcerated and come out and are kept out of the workforce, which seems really intuitive, but just important to, to name, right? If a person has um, something that they're doing as a, a career or trade, um, that person's going to be in a less likely position to engage in like the black market uh, or um, uh, uh, yeah, less, less traditional means of, of making money. Um, uh, so, so that was the, those were the kind of two players and, uh, and how we won. And also just to say that in New York, we've been really lucky. Our city council is pretty progressive, but, um, this stuff, this fair chance at this ban the box stuff, um, and the, uh, critique on our over incarceration system is now spreading to the point where last year, the governor of Kentucky, um, put in a, a, a ban the box law for public agencies in Kentucky. So this really does go beyond, um, you know, like a, a liberal conservative issue. Great. Thank you for that, that excellent summary. Um, we have another question somewhat related to that. Um, this person lives in Georgia and wants to know, do you have any advice um, about how she can effectively advocate for ban the box and save Georgia? She does mention that she believes North Carolina actually just passed this law um, recently, and so she wanted to know if you had any, any tips or, or strategies for how she could advocate for that. Yeah, cool. So um, uh, I the best advice I would give for people that are interested in this stuff is to find organizations that are already thinking about um, working on these issues either in your city or at the state level um, uh, and, and figure out ways that you all as law students can use your skills um, to help. Um, a lot of this stuff is already happening, right? If we're seeing in, in North Carolina and Kentucky, um, right, that, that if it's happening there, it's, it's possible and likely that we'll be able to get victories like this in other places that, um, that might be more conservative. So I'd imagine that there are people working on, on these issues and coalitions in other places and to, um, find those folks and go to them and, uh, and, and ask how, and ask them how you can be helpful. And they'll, um, they'll definitely <laughs> have work to do, whether it's knocking on doors or doing research, uh, doing legal research, um, you know, going to meetings, just showing up is such an important part for folks working on these issues. Great. Thank you. And I do just want to add here that, that this, um, something like advocating for, 
uh, new piece of legislation like the in the box would um, not be allowed during your AmeriCorps service hours. Uh, so I make sure that's clear for everybody. Um, you would you would need to do this on your own time. Of course, I know most of you are, are um, winding up your AmeriCorps service, so um, this would be something to do after your AmeriCorps participation ends. But um, thanks for that question. Um, and then uh, we have another question for you that says, uh, are there proposals to help educate those in prison uh, so that they can reenter the workplace with skills that help with employment or reenter the job market with skills that help with employment? Cool. Um, so I think that, that this kind of stuff tends to vary. Or not tends to. This stuff varies jurisdiction by jurisdiction or just place to place. Um, so in New York, where we have uh, such a, a wealth of nonprofits uh, and um, agencies that, um, that that can put people to work, um, helping people who are coming out, that exists, right? In other places, um, it might not so much, although I imagine that there are some, and I know AmeriCorps uh, and similar programs have things across the country that are helping people in reentry. Um, uh, also, uh, yeah, th there are other um, organizations that receive grants, like um, I know of Strive, that's a national, uh, S-T-R-I-V-E, that's a national workforce development organization that, that um, has a specific grant from uh, the Department of Labor to help, uh, uh, to help out on, on uh, to help people who are uh, leaving jails and prisons and, and entering work. So uh, I know that, that this stuff happens, but I don't know if in terms of like proposals at a national level or at a state level it exists. I, th I think that stuff tends to happen much more at the nonprofit um, level where nonprofits are getting grants to, um, to, people, to put people to work on this kind of stuff. Very good. Thanks so much. Um, we have one last question I'm going to ask here, and then, um, as you said before, if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to me, and, and I can get you connected with Eric. Um, but this is, says, do you know if, uh, if there's any ex-prisoners from New York prisons? Um, do they retain the right to vote when they reenter? Yeah. So in um, in New York, a person uh, is disenfranchised while they're incarcerated or on parole for felony convictions. Uh, and their voting rights should be restored upon completion of their uh, time incarcerated or when they're off parole. I don't know if they have to re-register um, or if you're um, – uh, I think I remember reading something about a, a person with more than one felony conviction um, has a, a, a more rigorous thing that they have to apply for. Um, but. Um, yeah, I know that in, in for in general, before those carve outs, um, a person who's in on a felony or on parole for a felony um, either gets it automatically restored or has to apply to have something restored, and then will get it restored upon the completion of their sentence. Great. Well, I wanted to um, say thank you one more time to Eric. Um, thanks for taking the time out today to share this information. Um, we'll be very excited and interested to continue hearing about the work that you're doing up in New York. Um, and of course, thank you to um, all of our participants today. We appreciated uh, you taking the time out of your day to learn um, about criminal convictions and especially as they relate to people um, finding jobs and then trying to fight against possible discrimination. Um, so we have, I'm going to end, end the recording now and we'll be sharing this um, later this week. Uh, thank you again to everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Brian, and again, apologies for the technical stuff, but happy we were able to do this. Take care, everyone. No worries. Thank you.